My name is Bob Stein. I'm the interim dean in the College of Continuing and Professional Studies. And on behalf of the college and learning life, uh, welcome to this evening's headliners event. Uh, as you can see, it's another uh, near record setting, if not record setting night. Uh, in fact, we have so many people that we might have some across the hallway tonight. Um, they're, 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 uh, we're being beamed over there, so, so this all works. Uh, and if you are sitting in that room or you end up sitting in that room, when we get to the question and answer session, if there's not too many people, we'll bring you back in as we did when Mark Seeley was here. If there are too many people, we don't have enough space. We have cards that are available. We'll collect those cards for the question and answer session and get to as many of them as we can. Uh, Catherine has brought several guests with her tonight. I'm going to recognize one. Her husband, Chad Reichwald, is sitting down here. Chad, welcome. Thanks for coming. These kind of folks always need great support. Sure, go for it. Her biggest fan. Um, maybe the, other than your children, right? So, um, you you might expect campus has been buzzing a little bit today with the announcement from the Regents last night about a, a finalist for the president's position, uh, Joan Gable, who's the provost at the University of South Carolina, is the named finalist. Uh, she'll be on campus, actually all five campuses uh, next week. They're talking about, I mean, what I've read, probably the same thing you have Monday through Wednesday, uh, zipping around to all the campuses and... Uh, I read someplace, one event here on the St. Paul campus, which we're happy to hear about, but uh, it'll be interesting for the uh, community to get to meet her, her and hear her. And uh, the regents have said they hope to be voting by before the end of the year on, on her candidacy. So folks are excited about that. Um, one of the things I did very early this morning is look up and uh, see what University of South Carolina has in terms of a college of continuing education or something like we are. Uh, they don't have something exactly uh, like we do. They do have one, so that will be an interesting conversation. Uh, if you were here back at our event in November, you remember I talked about midterms, uh, the exams, not, not the, the, uh, the election, but the exams. So amazingly, in a very short time, we now have students who are graduating this fall. We have uh, several dozen students who finished their programs in the fall, last night, we had an event which we do every year to uh, congratulate them. Their family members come. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful event where we can uh, recognize their accomplishments. Uh, you might have also paid attention and gotten about 1,000 emails about Give to the Max Day on November 15th. Uh, we participate in that as well. And here's the connection between the two things I'm just talking about. Uh, we had contributions of about $12,700 in Give to the Max compared to about 2,000 last year, so we're really appreciative of that. Uh, yeah, thank you. And ab about 11,000 of that will go uh, directly to scholarships for our students, and for many of our students, uh, that's really what allows them to continue uh, their educations. So if you didn't give to us during <laughs> Give to the Max, remember that next year, but there are other opportunities to give any time you want. Uh, and you can give to scholarships, but uh, we'll also have the opportunity for you to give directly uh, to support Learning Life and Headliners if you'd like to do that as well. So watch for information about that in the coming weeks. Also, one more uh, note, and uh, this is a, a place where I'm going to ask you to prove me right. Um, the uh, forthcoming winter-spring catalog will be Learning Life's last printed catalog. I think you've uh, seen that. Yeah, oh, I know. Other than... Uh, <laughs> Other than like Christmas catalogs, does anybody do catalogs anymore? I don't know, I, I, get, you know, five, I get five a day in the mail. Um, we'll continue to produce an electronic version of the catalog, which uh, can uh, be viewed and downloaded from the Learning Life website. Uh, and then here's the part where I say, prove me right. Uh, I expect many of you are like I am. Uh, we interact with our children and grandchildren uh, electronically quite often. I expect many of you do. And I'm thinking if you have the capability of doing that, you probably have the capability of going online, finding our catalog, and, uh, and seeing what we do. So prove me right about that, okay? Um, so to ensure you stay in the know about the programs and offerings, including headliners, you can subscribe to the uh, Learning Life News, which is a, a bi-monthly e newsletter. And if you'd like help doing that, uh, talk to Ana Anastasia or Vivian or somebody at the front desk, and we can make sure you get signed up for that. So, to this evening's event, uh, before we begin, as always, I ask that you mute your cell phones, and if you're active on social media, please follow Learning Life on Facebook and Twitter, and our 
the headliners hashtag is UMN Headliners. Many of you will remember the headliners presentation by Dr. Larry Jacobs in May 2016 when he suggested there was a path for Donald Trump to win the presidency. <laughs> and I was in the audience that night and I remember the collective gasp that went through this audience. And of course we now know uh, that what seemed impossible or at least very unlikely turned into reality. So much has happened since then, including the recent elections exactly a month ago. As she so ably did in December of 2016, we're pleased to have Dr. Catherine Pearson join us again to interpret the post-election landscape and in particular its implications for governing during at least the next two years. A highly respected and award-winning teacher and scholar, Dr. Pearson, uh, Pearson is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science here at the University of Minnesota in the College of Liberal Arts. Her research focuses on the United, United States Congress, congressional elections, political parties, and women in politics. Prior to coming to the university, Professor Pearson was a research fellow at the Brookings Institution and worked on Capitol Hill as a legislative assistant for two members of Congress. She received her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. Her first book, book was Party Discipline in the House of Representatives, and she's working on a new book entitled, I think this must be tentative, uh, Gendered Partisanship in the House of Representatives, which analyzes women in Congress and their pursuit of power in a partisan area, uh, era. Sorry. And then finally, let me add, uh, Catherine was our commencement speaker this past spring, where she encouraged students to become engaged and make a difference. She might do that tonight as well. So please help me welcome Dr. Catherine Pearson. Thank you very much. Thank you for that warm welcome. Uh, let me just log in to my own presentation real quick. Here we go. Well, I'm delighted to be with you tonight to discuss the 2018 midterm elections through the lens of political science. And I know that you have many great questions and I look forward to answering them after my presentation. Midterm elections differ from presidential elections in important ways. And so I wanna talk briefly about why this context matters and what it says to us about 2018. So of course, all 435 House seats were up. They are every two years. 35 of uh, the US of 100 US Senate seats were up. And in midterm elections, the president's party is always disadvantaged. Um, and in midterm since 1862, the president's party has averaged losses of about 32 seats in the House and around two seats in the Senate. In only three election cycles in the last century, has the president's party actually gained seats in the House in a midterm election in 2002, in 1998, and in 1934. And in all of those instances, the president was very popular. So the president's party is generally disadvantaged in midterm election years. And, the pres and presidential approval and the economy typically matter. In this particular election year, President Trump's relatively low approval rating of around 40% definitely mattered, uh, accounting for many of the losses uh, among Republicans. But actually, the strong economic performance, um, it's not to say that it didn't matter, but it, prevented, but it didn't sort of serve as the backstop to losing seats that Republicans hoped that it would. And also significantly, turnout is much lower in midterm elections than it is in presidential election years, usually around 20 percentage points later, uh, lower. And so that really helps shape the campaign strategy of both parties, trying to mobilize their base and get people out to vote who might not typically vote in midterm elections. Sort of all else equal, this lower turnout tends to help Republicans by about two or three percentage points as the midterm electorate tends to be, on average, older and whiter and more Republican than presidential election turnout. So that's sort of the general context about midterm elections. Um, and in 2018, Democrats did very well in the midterm elections, gaining, we think, uh, around 40 seats. There are still uh, a couple of undecided seats. One in California was just called this afternoon, of course, after I made this graphic. Um, but it, <laughs> of course, um, but it looks like Democrats will have gained at least 40 seats in this midterm election, 
Of course, one of the most interesting things was on election night, it looked like Democrats had gained at least 32 seats. So as votes continued to be counted um, in places like California, where the process is slow, Democrats continued to pick up those seats that were, that were very close as they continued to count votes. Democrats needed 23 seats to take majority party control. And so they, they cleared that, um, and in fact cleared that quite handily. But what is also significant is that midterm elections and congressional elections in general are less competitive than they used to be. So even though it was a very close election, there were only about 100 out of 435 House races that were even remotely competitive, and only about three dozen that were considered really competitive. And so what does this tell you? That Democrats pretty much ran the board on competitive races, plus picked up a few races that weren't deemed to be uh, as competitive. If you see here, these are the overall gains in U.S. House seats for the President's party from 1950 to 2018, and you can see in this uh, in, the President's Party has only actually gained seats and only a few seats in two of those cycles, 1998 and 2002, and in all the other um, cycles, but that number is well below zero because the President's Party has lost seats. So historically, uh, 2018 actually wasn't that far off the average. What is so striking about 2018 is that there just weren't that many competitive seats because congressional seats, uh, just like the country, are sort of closely divided these days. In 2016, I may have told you this uh, two years ago, there were only 23 districts, uh, 23 districts that voted for Clinton that were won by Republican congressional candidates. You can see in Minnesota, Minnesota's third district was one of them, where two years ago, Eric Paulson won Minnesota's third district by about 14 points, and Hillary Clinton carried that district by about 10 points. Of these 23 districts held by Republican members of Congress in the current Congress um, that voted for Clinton, Democrats in 2018 won 22 of these seats. So of course the most uh, vulnerable seats went first. Two years ago, there were only 12 uh, Democratic districts or 12 districts held by Democratic members of Congress that voted for Trump. You can see Minnesota actually had three of those, Minnesota's first, seventh, and eighth. These are also two of the three uh, that flipped. The other was Pennsylvania's 14th. So there just aren't that many congressional districts that vote for one party's candidate for Congress and the other party's candidate for the presidency. And that's a real departure from how things were, say, 10 and especially 20 years ago, when Democrats could have had 100 House seats that went for the Republican Party's presidential candidate. We just don't see that many of those swing districts anymore. Midterm elections are increasingly nationalized and a referendum on the president. So these are the results of poll data in midterm elections that ask, is your vote for president uh, a vote either against or for the president? And in this regard, 2018 shows that 33% of voters were saying that their vote is a vote against the president, 24% a vote for the president, um, looking like sort of another big election year in terms of a wave election like 2010 was against Obama. And so, again, keep in mind, the president isn't on the ballot, but yet a majority of voters are saying their vote in a congressional race is either for or against the president. So elections have become nationalized, and this is also true at the state legislative level. What were the results? Well, Democrats gained 40 seats. Um, Democrats needed, again, 23. They cleared that. The reason I show this map again is to show the geography of congressional districts. It looks like, according to this map, looking at congressional districts, that Republicans actually sort of are better represented. But we know that this map actually represents uh, a map where Democrats have picked up about 40 seats, but of course, Democratic seats tend to be smaller, more urban and suburban, and more geographically concentrated. If I were to show you this map, uh, you can see the distribution where all congressional districts are the same size, a cartogram done by the New York Times, you can see uh, the close divides between the two parties. And just to sort of illustrate the differences in the types of districts that each party's members represent, in the next Congress, House Democrats will represent 
79% of all Asian Americans in the country, 72% of all Latinos in the country, 66% of African Americans, 60% of college graduates, 45% of whites, 39% of Trump voters, and 20% of America's land area. So there's some real differences between districts that are represented by Democrats and districts that are represented by Republicans, which have implications for governing and for the types of incentives that members of Congress have, depending on what types of districts they represent. In 2018, this is another New York Times graphic showing the extent to which districts moved from Republican votes in 2016 to Democratic or Republican votes in 2018. And so you can see a majority of House districts moved uh, toward the Democratic Party, and in fact, some districts quite, uh, in quite significant ways. There were districts, though, that moved toward the Republican Party, and in fact, uh, Minnesota's uh, first and 8th District are among them. I'll talk about that more in a minute. Sort of contra contrast this map that the New York Times produced going from 2016 to 2018 with this map that they produced going from 2012 to 2016. So a real difference here um, between 2012 and 2016 and 2016 and 2018. Where did Democrats make gains? This graphic that appeared in the New York Times shows demographic gains in the suburbs. And if you, looked from le and if you look from left to right, you go from the most rural districts to rural suburban, sparse suburban, dense suburban, urban suburban, and then urban districts, and you can see several things. First, that Republican districts are concentrated in the more sparsely populated areas. They're more likely to be rural or rural suburban. And where, Democrat, and where Republicans picked up, pickups are denoted by the bold circles, the districts that flipped from one party to the other. It was in a rural area and sort of these uh, rural suburban areas. Democrats made pickups in every area, but especially in suburban districts. So you can see the Democrats, the Democratic pickups were concentrated in the sparse suburban and dense suburban areas. They didn't have that many seats to pick up in the urban areas. They were already, for the most part, Democratic. So Democrats are now much more likely to represent suburban districts than Republicans are, which is a real switch. Uh, these same dynamics also mean that Democrats gain seats in wealthier districts. So that today, this is another uh, graphic from the New York Times, Republicans lost ground in wealthier districts, and in the next Congress, Democrats will represent more wealthy districts. So of the congressional districts where the median income is on average more than $100,000, Democrats represent all those districts, including three districts that flipped. 75,000 to 100,000, Democrats represent a majority of those districts, including, you can see in bold, several of those districts that flipped. And so, once again, sort of real differences in the types of, of districts that Democrats and Republicans represent that really sort of became more pronounced after the 2018 elections. And so these national dynamics where Democrats are more likely to represent suburban districts and wealthier districts and Republicans are more likely to represent sparsely populated districts were repeated in Minnesota. So Minnesota, sort of per capita, um, uh, was sort of the one state that came out in terms of its the, uh, in terms of its partisan balance, exactly the same, yet half of its districts change parties. So the first district flips from uh, Democrat to Republican, the second district and the third district flip from Republican to Democratic, and the eighth district flips from Democrat to Republican. Two incumbents were defeated in the second and third, and the first and the eighth were open seats. So what this election did in Minnesota was basically make its congressional districts in line with presidential voting, with the exception of Minnesota's seventh district. So the first and the eighth, two years ago, went for Trump by about 15 points, but yet the Democratic incumbents hung on. This, in 2018, uh, Minnesota's 8th district went for Stauber, the Republican candidate, by five and a half points, and the 1st district remained close, but nonetheless, nonetheless the Republican candidate, Jim, Jim Hagedorn, won by about a uh, little less than half a percentage point. On the other hand, the 2nd district and the 3rd district um, flipped for the Democratic challengers, and the most interesting district, I think, is Minnesota's 3rd district, where Eric Paulson has been 
elected by re elected and then re-elected by big margins since he was first elected in 2008. He won by 14 points two years ago. But the third district is now much more in line with its presidential vote. The Washington Post sort of interviewed me for an article that they wrote about changes in voting patterns between the 2016 presidential vote and the 2018 congressional vote. And so sort of in advance of this article, they showed me these maps and they look the same in terms of where in the third district was voting Democratic and sort of the size of this vote. And so the reporter kept saying, okay, well, what changed between the 2016 presidential vote and the 2018 House vote? I'm like, nothing. Look at the map. It looks the same. Um, they're like, no, but there, it must have changed. I'm like, it didn't change at all if we're talking about sort of presidential vote in 2016 and House vote in 2018. I'm like, show me, you know, House vote in 2016 and we can have a different conversation. So he sort of finally got the story and the article read, oh, you know, now Minnesota's third district is in line with its presidential voting. But it was just sort of a, a funny um, exchange that these, this map really, really highlighted it. Minnesota was one of the most expensive states in terms of spending because of the fact that there were these four really competitive House races and one of its Senate seats was competitive. And so Larry Jacobs and I are working on a project tracking campaign finance in Minnesota and the final reports are not in yet. They're not due until the end of January, but based on FEC reporting with one week out, uh, we saw just millions and millions of dollars or over $45 million spent by outside groups in Minnesota. So this figure shows you only independent expenditures, never mind the millions of dollars that the candidates raised in hard money. This is only independent expenditures. And what this figure also shows, though it's a little bit hard to decipher, so I'll walk you through it, is that most of this money was spent attacking the other party's candidates. So among, in red, uh, that, that's the $24 million spent by outside groups to benefit Republican candidates. 94% of that money was spent attacking Democrats. And among the Democrats, $21 million, 68% of that money was spent attacking Republicans. So if you think that you saw a record number of negative ads in 2018, you did, and this is why. Um, the candidates, of course, were also running ads, but this money is just the money that was spent by outside groups, by parties, by super PACs, and by 501c4 groups, including groups that do not actually have to disclose the sources uh, of their funding. Turning now to the U.S. Senate, Republicans had a massive structural advantage going in. Democrats would have needed two more Senate seats to be in the majority, um, but Republicans in the end picked up two Senate seats. Republicans lost four, Democrats uh, lost, or excuse me, Democrats lost two, sorry, Republicans lost two, Democrats lost four uh, for a net gain for Republicans. Democrat, Democrats picked up Nevada and Arizona, but lost North Dakota, Missouri, Indiana, and Florida. But the map was always gonna be a problem for Democrats. Of the 35 Senate elections in 2018, 26 of them were in states or seats that Democrats were defending. And 10 of those Democrats were running in states that Trump won many, uh, by an average of 10 points. So the fact that Democrats like Joe Manchin in West Virginia hung on is really somewhat notable. And the Democrats picked up Nevada and Arizona, which were very, very competitive seats. So it could have been a much worse night for Democrats. I think there was a time when public opinion polls suggested that Democrats voters were very enthusiastic and thought the elections were very important and Republican voters had not yet begun to express that when Democrats started talking about maybe a, a Senate majority pickup um, but at the end of the day the map was always skewed um, it was always structurally better for uh, for Republicans I want to turn now to talk a little bit about voters. Um, I, I'll, I'll try to keep this relatively brief, but there's some important dynamics going on with voters in 2018. And I think the first is, once again, we can congratulate Minnesota on the highest voter turnout in the country. Minnesota's midterm turnout was 64%. Pretty amazing. And that is up 13 points from four years ago. So, Turnout nationally was at its highest level 
in 104 years at just a hair above 50%. Um, so that is, that's a big deal. Um, but of course, uh, it's much lower than presidential turnout. So it's 64%. Minnesota was up 13 points from four years ago, but down 11 points from 2016. But on average, midterm election turnout is about 20 points lower than presidential year turnout. So uh, Minnesota did very well. Cook County, Carver County, Hennepin County, all well over 70% in terms of voter turnout. And of course, and so, so what I'm gonna show you now is US House vote in a, from a nationally representative sample from 2008 to 2018. Um, and this, so what is graphed here is the Democratic share of the two-party House vote. And so what we're really looking at is sort of that 50% line. And you can see in 2018, Democrats did better in terms of the national vote uh, than they had in many years, uh, not, since, not just since 2008, which was of course a great year for Democrats, um, but for several decades. But what you can also see is that House vote sort of fluctuates between the two parties. And that is really important for understanding the dynamics at work inside Congress. Members of Congress on both sides of the aisle are constantly competing for majority party control, knowing that you know, we're a closely divided nation, and so zigzags back and forth are the norm. And so really ever since the 1994 elections, when Democrats took control of, uh, lost control of the House of Representatives, for the first time in 40 years, both parties have been sort of keenly aware that either party could have majority party control after the next election, and it has made things very competitive, sort of on top of the policy differences that they already have. The other point I want to make about the national share of uh, the two-party vote is that Democrats have to do better than 50 for, than than 50 percent or 50 percent, you know, plus one vote in order to be in the majority, because Democratic districts are less efficient than Republican districts. So if you see in uh, 2012 the national two-party share of Democrats' House vote is about 50 percent. But Republicans, nonetheless, were in the majority party in 2012 um, because there are more sort of wasted Democratic votes in densely populated Democratic districts. And so, and this, I know, I know everyone's going to say redistricting. And yes, redistricting is part of it. But even with sort of a neutral criteria to draw district lines, Democrats are just more concentrated in urban areas. And so Democratic candidates tend to win by bigger margins than Republican candidates do. And so that means that in order to be in the majority, Democrats have to be a couple percentage points above 50% in terms of national vote. Women overwhelmingly, uh, with a gender gap of 12 points, voted for Democratic candidates. This is about the same gender gap that we saw in 2016, although Republican, although men uh, voted more Democratic than they did in, um, in 2016. But still, 51% of men voted for the Republican candidates, and 59% of women voted for the Democratic candidates. So the gender gap is big. It was big in 2016. The highest, or highest ever by about a point. And so sort of a question was, would it persist in 2018? And the answer is yes. Um, and this graphic from the New York Times, which I love, in midterm elections sort of shows how the gender gap moves in midterm elections from 1982 to 2018. So women are on the left, men are on the right, and you can see that in most elections, a majority of Democratic, a majority of women vote Democratic. Uh, 19, uh, excuse me, uh, let's see, yeah, 2010 was an exception. We have women here, uh, a majority of women voting Republican. Um, but that it varies in terms of its size and in terms of both the swing toward the left and the right and the size of the gap from cycle to cycle. And you can see here in 2018, women are sort of way off to the side voting Democratic, and, but nonetheless, the gap is still pretty big. Now, why is this? This figure shows Partisan identification, not vote choice, but partisan identification when people are asked in surveys which party they identify with from 1952 to 2016. And I show this graph uh, to make a point that many political scientists have made. Um, these are data from John Petrosik and Karen Kaufman that men have left the Democratic Party. It's not as though women have moved, but men have actually left. So. Uh, 
Democratic women are bolded in blue. And as you can see, the percentage of women who identify as Democrats is actually fairly stable from 1952 to the present. Now, the light blue line is harder to see, but it represents the percentage of men who identify as Democrats. And right in 1952, actually, more men were more likely, slightly, to identify as Democrats as Republican. Both were identifying in 1964 at 61%. But then beginning in the mid-1960s and continuing uh, through today, men are leaving the Democratic Party as the Democratic Party is sort of becoming more liberal, more interested in women's rights, civil rights, and the gender differences are really, so many people think they're probably because of you know, feminist issues, but it's really because if you look at public opinion polls, men and women differ in terms of the size of government, the government's role in providing a social safety net and issues of war and peace. It is also important to point out that women are not a monolithic group. If you remember back to 2016, 53% of white women voted for Donald Trump. Um, women voted more evenly this cycle. White women voted evenly this cycle, but the gender gap is largely fueled by women of color. So if you look at African Americans, um, a very consistent group in terms of voting for Democrats. Nonetheless, black women are more likely to vote Democratic than black men. If you look at Latinos and Latinas, sort of a similar dynamic, and then white women and white men over here. So it sort of is important to remember that you know men, people have many different identifications, um, and women of color and single women are li largely fueling this gap. Turning to age, there are some pretty major differences in vote choice. If you look at 18 to 29 year olds and 30 to 44 year olds, 67% and 50% respectively voted for Democratic candidates in 2018. These are national exit polls. And 50% of voters age 45 and above voted uh, for Republicans more than Democrats. And, <coughs> and so this is significant to both parties' future. So political science research suggests that partisan identification is actually relatively stable, that we don't tend to see that many people switching their partisan identification as they age, sort of contrary to some, I think, conventional wisdom. You can see this displayed as well with age and US House vote from 2008 to 2018. Of course, sort of people shift into different groups over time, but the 18 to uh, 39 year olds are the most democratic group of the four age cohorts. And so the Democratic Party is excited about that, but it's also important to remember that young voters are by far the least reliable voters and the most likely not to vote in midterm elections. Um, this, once again, these New York Times graphics, these only show the 18 to 29 year olds and the 60 plus. Um, again, remember, of course, there are new people moving into these groups over time, but the age difference has really gotten bigger over time. When it comes to race, whites are solidly voting Republican, 54% of whites voting Republican in 2018, although that's down from 2016, and voters of color sort of overwhelmingly supporting Democratic candidates. Latinos went from 7 to 11% of the electorate uh, from 2014 to today. So although voters of color remained underrepresented, underrepresented in midterm electorate, electorates, the percentage of Latinos actually rose pretty dramatically from four years ago. Once again, sort of this is from 2008 to 2018, looking at race in the U.S. House vote, African Americans being the most consistently loyal Democratic voters and white voters being the least consistent. Again, it wouldn't be a conversation without the New York Times graphics, so sort of a similar, similar line that shows the trend over time. The last cross tab I'll talk about is education. And in part that's because education has really changed between 2012 and 2016, and those changes remained consistent in 2018. In 2016, education predicted vote choice more than ever before. Clinton won voters with a college degree 52% to 43%. And Trump won voters without a college degree by eight points. Obama, on the other hand, four years earlier, had won both groups 50% and 51% respectively. So Clinton got more of the white college-educated vote 
than Obama did, and Trump got significantly more of the white uh, non-college educated vote. And those patterns persisted, although not quite as starkly, in 2018. Um, so among the 41% of the electorate who had a college degree, 59% voted Democratic, and those without a college degree voted evenly between the Democrats and Republicans. Um, and again, this figure, looking from 2008 to 2018, separates this out uh, according to whether or not someone has uh, a postgrad degree, a college degree, some college or high school or less. Um, and you can sort of see some of these changes in 2016. College-educated women are the most loyal uh, among Democratic voters, among white Democratic voters. Um, and non-college men are sort of the most Republican among white voters. And then finally, there are important regional differences. The South, of course, up until a couple decades ago, voted solidly Democratic. So Democrats would send liberal and very conservative members to Congress from the South. Of course, now the South is one of the most Republican areas uh, of the country. And if you look at this figure of US House vote by region, the South is also the area of the country least likely to send Democrats to Congress today. Midterm voters vote their party. 95% of Democrats voted for the Democratic House candidate in 2018, and 94% of Republican voters voted for the Republican House candidate. So voters voted their party ID to an even greater extent than they did in 2016. So we talk about all of these factors that might affect vote choice. Party ID remains absolutely central. 54% of independents voted for the Democratic candidate in 2018, of course, giving Democrats a big edge in a country that's relatively evenly divided between the two parties. And then finally, the exit polls revealed, once again, that 26% of voters said that their vote was to support Trump, 38% said that it was to oppose Trump, and only 33% said Trump was not a factor. And again, Trump was not actually on the ballot. Um, and then finally, uh, in terms of the most important issue facing the country, Democrats and Republicans differed pretty significantly on this, both in terms of the issues that they identified and in the way that affected vote choice. <laughs> Health care was considered the most important issue facing voters, um, but immigration was second. But immigration's importance was mainly from Republican voters, um, if you look at survey data on this. And what's interesting is that eco the economy was third. And perhaps that was because the economy was doing very well on election day. But what was interesting about this is that a strong economy did not translate into Republican gains, or it did not help Republicans stave off the Democratic uh, blue wave. And so despite the fact that the economy was doing well, as he campaigned for his uh, fellow Republicans, President Trump really stepped on that issue, sort of in the news cycle, crowded out the strong economy and talked a lot about immigration and the caravan uh, and things that were more divisive to voters. And indeed, immigration was more divisive to voters in 2018 than it had been in 2012. Immigration views were more influential on vote choice, which is to say, those who were opposed to immigration, those on the left-hand side uh, of the chart, were 17 points more likely to support sorry, the right-hand side of the chart, those who are opposed to immigration were 17 points more likely to support Republican candidates in 2018 than they were in 2012. And those supporting immigration were 16 points more likely to support Democratic candidates uh, than they were in 2012. In 2012, immigration just wasn't as salient of an issue as it was today. But now the two parties offer much starker choices on immigration, and voters are responding uh, with sort of increased support um, for candidates of both parties, depending on their position. I want to turn now to women setting records in 2018. We talked about the gender gap in vote choice, but 2018 was also a significant year because a record number of women were elected to the US Congress and elected to state legislatures and elected to the governor's mansions. <laughs> yeah. And political scientists have, but an important caveat, 
women are still dramatically underrepresented. This means, this record year, means that women will now constitute about 24% of the US Congress. So that's still pretty dramatic underrepresentation. And scholarly research has shown, sometimes my students are surprised by this, that when women run for Congress and the state legislature, women win at the same rate as men do. The dearth of women candidates is what causes women's underrepresentation. So, what happened in 2018? Well, women set records. There were 476 U.S. House primary candidates, 53 U.S. Senate primary candidates, and women actually won their primaries at higher rates than men, not the same rate. But this sort of rosy story is very much concentrated in the Democratic Party. There was a massive partisan gap. Women were 43% of Democrats' nominees for the U.S. House and Senate, and women were 22% of Republicans' nominees for the Senate, but only 13% of Republicans' nominees for the House. But sort of after the primary, a record number of women were on the ballot, 257 for the House and Senate, and women of color were one-third of all of U.S. House candidates, setting another record, and there were 33 races that featured a woman versus another woman, another record. So, the trans so this translated into a record number of women in the U.S. House and in the U.S. Senate. 102 women will serve in the House, 89 Democrats and 13 Republicans. There are 43 women of color and 36 new women. Of the 36 new women, that's the largest incoming class of women members of Congress, 35 of those women are Democrats, one of those women is a Republican. The divide in the Senate is also stark. Of the 24 women senators, 17 are Democrats and seven are Republicans. And then there will be nine women governors, six Democrats and three Republicans. So pretty dramatic uh, gender differences. And in fact, with the dramatic increase in Democratic women, the number of Republican women actually went down. And I just told you that political scientists consistently find that women and men win at the same rate well, in 2018, non-incumbent Democratic women actually won at a higher rate than men. So a little over a quarter of non-incumbent Democratic women won, but only 3% or one uh, of non-incumbent Republican women won. Democratic women had the highest win percentage rate among non-incumbents of the four-party gender groups, and nearly six in 10 non-incumbent Democrats who won were women. 3% of Republican non-incumbent winners were women. So pretty dramatic differences between the two parties. This is from USA Today. It shows that we've also elected the most diverse Congress in US history. Sort of the light blue are white Democrats, the light red are white Republicans, and uh, you can see the Asian, Hispanic, uh, and black Democrats and Republicans show that sort of all in all, this is the most diverse Congress in the US history. But once again, the parties are going in the opposite direction. In the next Congress, the percentage of white men is a share of House Democrats will decline from 41% to 38% as a result of the 2018 election. But the percentage of white men is a share of House Republicans will rise from 86% to 90%. This is a graphic of first-term Democrats and first-term Republicans. <laughs> to sort of put, you can just sort of visually sort of see the descriptive representation. Before I wrap up, I want to talk briefly about Minnesota. Not surprising anyone, Senator Amy Klobuchar won with 60% of the vote, her same, the same rate that she has in the last couple of elections. Senator Tina Smith won with 53% of the vote. Uh, Governor-elect Tim Waltz won with 54% of the vote, and AG-elect Keith Ellison won with 49% of the vote. And so the AG's race was the most competitive um, of those races, but nonetheless, Tina Smith's race was ranked as competitive, although not uh, a toss-up. I think what did surprise some observers on election night was that 18 DFL or 18 seats in the state house flipped. So DFL, the DFL needed 11 
to be in the majority in the House, and 18 of them flipped. And once again, it was those suburbs that were really key to, de to the DFL taking uh, the majority party status in the next chamber. There were several close races that f went the Democrats' way, but then there were also races that surprised people, such as Jennifer Loon's seat in Eden Prairie, which wasn't, you know, sort of up on the list of the most competitive races. And so it was once again these changes in suburban districts where now state legislative voting patterns look a little bit more like presidential patterns. Nationally, Democrats won control of 313 more legislative seats, six more state legislatures, and seven, seven governor's races. Perhaps most striking, Minnesota is the only one of all 50 states that has one chamber controlled by one party and the other chamber controlled by the other party. So once again, you know, states are behaving, voters are behaving the same in most of their vote choices, resulting in less divided government. And we see that sort of everywhere. And of course, Minnesota, um, we have only uh, a, diff a party difference of one in the state Senate. Republicans control the Senate by one seat. In 2018, this graphic is from the Secretary of State's website. You know, once again, we see these regional differences where urban areas are deep blue in terms of their vote choice for governor, and the more rural, sparsely populated areas are deep red, and sort of, you know, some of the exurban areas are shaded in between. But again, you know, Minnesota, to a much greater extent in the past, has a rural, suburban, urban divide that will definitely affect legislating in the next session. And these results come from a Pew survey uh, in 2018 asking registered voters nationally whether they identify as urban, suburban, or rural, and finding some real partisan differences between them that aren't that surprising. But then also high numbers of voters saying that most people who live in different types of communities don't understand the problems that they face. So 70% of rural voters are likely to say that, compared to 65% of urban voters and 52% of suburban voters. So what are the implications for governing for the next two years? Well, obviously, divided government in Washington, which we have more often than not, will return uh, in January. And this means that the parties will be competing for their policy agendas and their political agendas. They're already thinking about 2020, both in terms of House races, Senate races, the presidential race, and with deeply divided but narrowly divided parties in the United States, it's a very competitive environment, and that disincentivizes compromise. So I expect a fair amount of gridlock and minimal bipartisan cooperation. Donald Trump remains popular among Republicans. I hesitate to make any predictions because who knows what's going to happen, and this is on tape somewhere. But, you know, sort of absent uh, any surprises from the Mueller investigation or anything else, and, you know, anything is pos possible, it doesn't seem likely, at least as of today, that Trump will be seriously challenged for the nomination in 2020. Whereas Democrats, dozens of them, are chomping at the bit in 2020. Democrats are also worried about keeping their House majority. Democrats would also like to be in the majority in the Senate. And so this means that Democrats in the House will pass bills related to immigration reform, DACA, ethics reform, gun control, pay equity, voting rights, Medicare for all, protecting the ACA, trying to undo tax cuts. So there'll be a lot of Democratic initiatives that'll get at least 218 votes and, of course, never go anywhere in the Senate or uh, even if they were to, uh, they'd be vetoed by the president. On the other hand, Republicans in the Senate will be looking to confirm a lot of judicial appointments, um, and both parties may be a little bit more open to deals on infrastructure, drug prices, and trade, sort of areas where both parties may see that working together may be for the greater good or really greater gain uh, than being um, persistently in conflict. But it is also the case that the House of Representatives will use its majority party control and its oversight power to subpoena a lot of people in the executive branch. Um, that will include both routine oversight of the executive branch, which we have not seen for the last two years, which is one of Congress's functions, and then of course will also uh, include a lot of oversight of the president um, and his activities. And so I think, you know, as soon as Democrats take control, the subpoenas will start going out from some of those committee chairs.
I'm a little more optimistic about divided government in Minnesota. Senate Republicans seem enthusiastic about cooperating with the new governor, um, not happy to be cooperating with uh, a DFL-controlled House, but nonetheless, it seems, at least in the, the initial sort of press conferences in language coming from both parties uh, in the, in the governor-elect, that the there might be room for more cooperation than we've seen in the last couple years in Minnesota. But again, both parties will be thinking, well, already are thinking about the 2020 elections. And so if you have questions about that, I'll do my best to answer them um, in Q&A. But I'll sort of wrap up this formal part of my presentation just by sort of reiterating the fact that people's partisan identifications are stronger than ever. It's what political scientists refer to as effective polarization. They like their own party and they dislike the other party even more. And this affects the mass public. This affects uh, legislators in Washington and at the state level. And it makes it increasingly difficult to get things done. So with that, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Catherine. Fascinating. Lots of information. I expect many more questions than there was information there. And Anastasia, I'm going to ask you first, do we have folks across the hall now? Okay, all right. So we're going to have some people coming in the back. So um, have someone with a hand up way over there next to the wall and a red hat. It seems to me that the key to having not so polarized a government is to have competitive uh, campaigns so that you don't have all Democrats in one district and all Republicans in the other. And it seems to me that the key to that is gerrymandering and so that we can get districts that, that represent the core and not the extremes of the party because in the primaries, the extreme people always come out to vote and so we get candidates that are, represent the extreme of the left and right. What can we do to get more representative gerrymandering? We have a few more Democrats in the, Senate, in the governorships, but that doesn't mean they're not going to gerrymander it the other way around. We need more right. equity. Right. And, of course, gerrymandering is done by state legislatures and then uh, approved by governors. And there used to be sort of natural breaks on gerrymanders because a majority of state governments were divided. Uh, governor of one party, legislature of another. And so that was sort of a natural break on gerrymandering to partisan advantage. There can be other types of gerrymanders. And so there's no doubt that gerrymandering can cause, uh, it can produce an advantage for one party or the other. You know, certainly Democrats did a lot of gerrymandering in California in the 80s. Um, Republicans did it in Indiana in the 80s. There was a Supreme Court case about this. And after the 2020, or after the 2010 census, Republicans were better positioned to redraw lines, producing uh, added seats for Republicans because of gerrymandering. But the problem with sort of attacking gerrymandering as the only cause of the polarization inside the House is that the polarization comes from members representing all sorts of districts. Um, so yes, Democrats representing Republican states, you know, or Republican districts such as Colin Peterson are more likely to compromise. But in general, the voting records of most members of Congress are well above 90% in agreement with their party and against the other party, even in districts that are more evenly divided by party or have been drawn by an impartial uh, commission. So I think there's a, lot of ra there's a lot of good reasons to reform gerrymandering so that one party doesn't have a huge advantage. So if you look at states where you know, the statewide vote is within five points, but yet it's massively imbalanced in terms of the number of seats, I mean, that's pretty clearly unfair. The Supreme Court doesn't see it that way, but maybe someday, not anytime soon. Um, but nonetheless, you can sort of point to what political scientists have referred to as an efficiency gap. Um, but in terms of solving the problem of polarization in the House of Representatives, gerrymandering isn't it's only one of so many factors that I think getting rid of gerrymandering would make things more fair between the parties, but there's not a lot of hope that it would dramatically reduce partisan polarization, unfortunately. Okay, I have one right here in front. One quick question. 
um, you talked a lot about the differences between men and women voting. What was the difference between the percentage of women who voted as a, against the percentage of men who voted? And then can you speak to um, former Congressman John Dingell's ideas that he posted recently, specifically about eliminating or abolishing the Senate? Um, so, uh, to answer your first question, according to the exit polls, 52% of the electorate was comprised of women and 48% was comprised of men, um, which was not that dissimilar. For, it was a little bit more dramatic than the presidential election, but not that dissimilar. Women typically vote at a slightly higher rate than men, and women are also less likely to be serving out, uh, they're also more likely to be eligible voters, less likely to be serving out you know, prison sentences, ex-felons, restricted, et cetera. Um, <laughs> John Dingell served longer in the U.S. House of Representatives than literally any other representative, and so he's very partial to the House. Um, so I'll sort of start with that. Um, point no <laughs> but, you know, malapportionment in the Senate is um, sort of structurally favors some states at the expense of others, and it definitely today favors the Republican Party at the expense of the Democratic Party. It hasn't always been that way, but it is definitely uh, the case that you know smaller states are more likely, though not, certainly not all, to be Republican, and bigger states are more likely to be Democratic. And so if you look at sort of how we get an electoral college where Hillary Clinton can win by three million votes in the popular vote and then lose in the electoral college. You know, California is sort of part of that story. New York is part of that story. And of course, that bias is reflected through malapportionment in the U.S. Senate. Um, but the Supreme Court has been pretty clear that they're not going to do anything about that. They don't allow malapportionment in state senates, but, you know, the U.S. Senate is in the Constitution and we're stuck with it. Okay, Anastasia, back here in the middle. Yes, my question uh, relates more to the mechanics of voting mm -hmm. and the disparity that seems to exist from state to state. And is there any way to nationalize a voting method? That's such a great question. Not easily. I mean, yes, Congress could pass a law, but states, accord, you know, but states do, they are in, char in charge of, uh, how they vote. Um, and so could there be a constitutional amendment about voting? I mean, that's obviously an arduous process, yes. And then there are some things that Congress can pass by law and not a constitutional amendment. Um, but nonetheless, you know, the Constitution does leave to the states a lot of this responsibility. Um, certainly the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, those all involved you know, those weren't constitutional amendments, those were acts passed by Congress, signed into law, including provisions that disproportionately affected southern states that the Supreme Court has now um, ended. But I think, I mean, there are many states in this particular cycle where you can point to serious problems with voting. I think what's happening in North Carolina's ninth district right now is certainly sort of a very egregious example of something. But I think, I mean, something is clearly going to happen there. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but at a minimum, because, I mean, the House is not going to seat the Republican winner from North Carolina's 9th District um, until this is resolved. And I don't know if resolved means a new election or, I, I don't, I mean, I'm not going to predict how this turns out, but I don't think that North Carolina's 9th District is going to have a member of Congress anytime soon. Um, and I think that's really going to sort of shine a light on the most egregious practices um, disenfranchising voters of color. Okay, Vivian. As a political scientist, could you speak to the uh, implications of going to a system of nonpartisan primaries and rank choice voting? So two different questions. So California has nonpartisan primaries. They passed this by ballot initiative um, a couple cycles ago. And it is not, ha so the rationale, that was, was on the ballot, voters approved it, the rationale was that you would get more moderates elected if you had top two um, primaries instead of partisan primaries. And so, you know, in, in essence, this would mean that sort of Republicans in many district districts could vote for the less, of, the less liberal of the two Democratic choices. But it has not worked out that way at all. Um, 
and in fact, so California, I um, can't remember if it, it, in a delegation of 53, I think it just, I, don't quote me on this, but I think it just went down to seven Republicans. And Republicans were just shut out of Orange County. I mean, really, really striking. I grew up in California. Um, this, is, this is not how California used to be. And seven, thank you. And the, the top two primary system sort of did not produce these moderating results at all. I mean, you can point to a couple races. And you know, Dianne Feinstein won re-election. She was challenged from the left um, by uh, Kevin DeLeon. But on the other hand, Loretta Sanchez was the more moderate candidate with Loretta Ch Sanchez, a representative um, from California, and Kamala Harris. And of course, uh, Harris won by big margins. And sort of that dynamic is repeated at many um, House district levels. And what almost happened to Democrats in 2018, including many of the seats they newly picked up, was they were actually almost shut out of the process completely. Because you had open seats where like 10 Democratic candidates were running and two Republican candidates were running. And so there was this real concern among Democrats and it really a push to try to get some people to drop out to make sure that it didn't wind up splitting the votes 10 ways between the Democrats and two ways between the Republicans and winding up with, with no Democrats um, on the ballot. I personally think that both parties should have someone on the ballot. I don't think it's good for voters of one party to be completely shut out. That's just my view on that. Um, but the results in California, you know, a couple incumbents sort of were faced off against each other because it was also after redistricting. Um, you know, the Democratic Party had to spend millions and millions of dollars on two Democrats running against each other. But for the most part, I don't think it's made a huge difference. Ranked choice voting, you know, it's interesting. In Maine, the representative that was elected to the House on the first ballot was not actually the first choice. So it did make a difference in Maine. Um, for their House candidate, um, the Democrat who ultimately wound up winning, so it could make it. So it could make a difference in some in some races, and I think, I think for a very informed electorate, I think people would feel good about having more choices. Some of the concerns about ranked choice voting are that it can be sort of off-putting or even disenfranchising to voters who, you know don't sort of vote as regularly and are turned off by the extra sort of information requirements of the process, both in terms of learning about the candidates and then the process itself. Okay, Anastasia. Hi, could you give some historical perspective or just perspective to uh, what's going on in the lame duck sessions of Wisconsin and <laughs> Michigan? <laughs> And a couple of years ago in what North North Carolina, I think. Yeah, I mean it's <laughs> you know this is not this is not the way transfer of power is supposed to work. Um, this is not the way transfer of power is supposed to work, and especially you know it's one thing to pass laws that the next legislature can undo, but it's even a step beyond that to literally limit the power of a new governor and attorney general by limiting what the office can do after voters have elected a new governor. I mean, I think what's going on in Wisconsin, Wisconsin is you know, utterly egregious, and I'm not totally sure what the re end result will be. I mean, you know, obviously they knew that this was not gonna go over well with the public, doing this in the middle of the night, um, but I think it remains to be seen, sort of, is there a successful court challenge? Is the court of a public opinion in Wisconsin sort of so strong that, you know, particularly among Evers supporters, is it so strong that they sort of feel like they're forced to undo this? Otherwise, the ramifications two years from now in electoral politics will be pretty extreme. I don't know. I don't know, but it's pretty egregious. Okay, Catherine, we have one over here on the right side. Yes. Uh, it seems like in this, up until this election, there were very few military service, prior, prior service people who ran or were elected to public office. Uh, it seemed like there were more this time around, but I have not seen any analysis of the impact of this uh, public service of any type being included in um, success rates or, or even running? Mm -hmm. So great question that in general, 
The U.S. House of Representatives traditionally has had a number of members of Congress who have served. Um, it's really only in the last 10, 15 years that there have been many fewer. Um, so it used to be that you know you sort of look at the Armed Services Committee and sort of you know there were a lot of veterans, a lot of people with military service, and that really informed policy. That sort of as fewer people are in the service, that has subsided, and people who serve in the House of Representatives are more likely to, are most likely to come from the professions of law, business, education, and sort of a, and, and other forms of politics um, rather than a military career. But both parties at various points have strategically recruited candidates with military experience. And we definitely saw this in this cycle. We've seen it in cycles before as well. Um, uh, Democrats sort of did this with some women veterans um, uh, in many cases in prior cycles. And so I think parties do try to do this strategically, but I can't actually tell you the answer to whether or not the success rate um, is any different. But clearly the parties think it will be when they're strategic about recruiting. Okay, over on the left side here. What are the pros and cons of voting by by mail, like they do in um, Colorado and Oregon. In Oregon. Um, well, the pros are higher vote turnout. Um, it makes it easier for people to vote. Um, you know, there's certainly concerns about sort of ballots getting lost or fraud, but not concerns that have been founded. Um, certainly, one concern, and this also actually applies to early voting is that campaign dynamic new information can emerge and campaign dynamics can change and you know there were certainly people trying to you know get their ballot back by a certain point and, and, and that is not easier than showing up on election day so um, so yeah it'll be interesting to see how, sort of how far Minnesota goes in considering that I know that it's something that what the Star Tribune reported that they're talking about so I think stay tuned. Um, as I think if, they, as, if the legislature considers that, we'll learn a lot more about it. Okay, thank you. Another one over here on the right side. The question I want to ask is about the Electoral College. There has been some movement afoot to change the Electoral College um, because of the disconnect between the popular vote and the original intent of the Electoral College. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about mm -hmm. your views on that and what you see possibly happening. Thank you. Right, good question. So at the most fundamental level, it would require a constitutional amendment, which is not going to happen because it has gone from being an issue where it wasn't totally clear which party would be advantaged or disadvantaged to an issue where very clearly Democrats are disadvantaged by the Electoral College and Republicans are advantaged. If you think back to 2000, there was actually sort of it came out later that that the Bush campaign was sort of trying to figure out what to do if uh, George Bush won the popular vote, you know, getting such big margins in Texas, and uh, Al Gore won the Electoral College vote. Well, we know how that turned out. Um, but you know, there was no sort of discussion in, in 2016 about whether or not a Republican candidate would win the popular vote and a Democratic candidate would win the Electoral College vote. Now, to be clear, in 2016, all of the pundits, the polls, sort of everyone thought that Clinton would just win, but bracket that. So I think if we were ever going to see real movement for Electoral College reform, it would have been in the wake of 2000. It would have been in the wake of 2000, also sort of throw in Florida and the very close, complicated, election there, but now it has become a partisan issue and a constitutional amendment would just not gain the necessary support from Congress or the states that it would need. Now many, you know, some states, and I can't remember how many offhand, some states have sort of agreed to a compact whereby if enough states would agree to this, that they would just vote for the popular vote winner with their electoral college votes. Um, but. I think it's unlikely that enough states would also be incentivized to do that for some of the same underlying partisan reasons. Um, and I think, I mean, you know, if we were designing a constitution from scratch, I think, you know, it seems really sort of crazy that uh, the popular vote winner is not the winner. But I think changing it now would have some interesting consequences in terms of campaign strategy, which voters you know, sort of are engaged in the campaign cycle by the campaigns and candidates. Um, and then the other thing is, of course, you know, we, votes are still being counted 
in parts of the US in three different house races. And so if we went to a popular vote system, and I'm not saying this is not a reason to change, you know, it is very likely that it would take a very long time after each presidential election for us to know who the president is. And again, that's not a reason not to change it, but it would be an interesting dynamic. So if, if I recall, there were at one time some states that apportioned their electoral college votes. Is anyone doing that anymore? There are two. There are two. And a terrible reform would be to make the electoral college uh, go by vote in congressional districts. Because the same dynamics that I, so first of all, then gerrymandering would affect the electoral college as would this sort of natural advantage for Republicans who are more likely to represent sparsely populated areas where Democrats are more likely to win with, you know, 75% of the vote next to a Republican district with 55% of the vote. So that would not be a solution that would be very helpful at all. Okay, great, thank you. Go on, Anastasia. Can you talk about the military vote, both uh veterans, different by, you know, by age or gender, whatever, mm -hmm. and currently enlisted military who apparently are exposed a lot to Fox News. Right, so, in, so there are a lot of correlates to vote choice, um, but in general, military voters lean Republican, but certainly are not monolithically Republican. Um, sort of, you know, home state, party ID, gender, age, level of education, these things all come into play as well. And so obviously military veterans are not a monolithic group, but sort of all else equal, they're slightly more likely to vote Republican. Okay, I have one right here in front. So I have two questions. One is um, what you think the likelihood is of getting higher turnout, um, let's say over the next decade in non-white um, communities. And the second one is, when do the demographics show that the non-white population will exceed the white population? So in answer to the second question, I'm not a demographer, but I think around 2055, but I could be off on that. Google might have a more reliable answer than me, but that's sort of, and these estimates change a little bit. Um, and so sort of if you look at the data that I showed, that clearly advantages Democrats. Um, but there is a pretty big gap in turnout. But I think, I, mean, I think it really depends on the strategic behavior of both parties and the extent to which Democrats try to mobilize voters of color. You know, for many years, Democrats sort of knew, especially with African American voters, that they were a very reliable part of the base. And so not a lot of attention was paid to either distinctive concerns or mobilization. Um, and and so, so African American voters were sort of captured by the Democratic Party. But I think now, as especially as more rural white voters and white voters without college degrees are voting more Republican than in the past, I think that Democrats have sort of realized that, you know, one, from a policy perspective, they need to be more attentive to, you know, a critical part of their base, and from a mobilization perspective, it's really important. And I think 2018 really illustrated that for Democrats. So it will likely be a trend that continues. Okay, far left side there. I got a couple questions um, for Minnesota 2020, one Minnesota and one national. So the state Senate was not up for vote this year outside of that one special election, which was very heavily Republican, so everybody knew it was probably going to go that way. Mm -hmm. So given the way the vote went this year, where the Democrats picked up seats, for generic Republican if in 2020, what do they, what do you think would be happen with the Senate? You know, if a generic Republican, would there be enough votes that have been picked up by the Democrats to flip or you know, what would happen? And then the second question is nationally, do you think and everybody think there's gonna be a lot of money thrown in Minnesota again for the twenty twenty election? Um, if only I knew the answers to these questions. But, so had the Minnesota Senate been on the ballot this year, sort of especially given the one seat margin, I think had it been a 2018 race, I think there's really no question that the Senate would have flipped. Um, a lot can happen between now and 2020. And so, you know, part of this depends on the strength for both parties at the top of the ticket, because of course in a presidential election year, you know, turnout matters, sort of how enthusiastic people are about the top of the ticket matters. And, you know, Minnesota, one and a half percentage points for Clinton in 2016. 
very, very close. You know, obviously after the 2016 elections, Republican majorities in the state house uh, in both chambers. Um, so, you know, clearly a state that elects Republicans. However, Minnesota is also the, long, the state that has gone the longest without voting for a Republican presidential candidate. Um, and so, one of the things that 2018 showed that is that it is, if it is a good year for Democrats, a Democratic candidate can win on the strength of DFL turnout in the metro, in sort of the broader metro communities. But if it's not a good year for Democrats, that is not the case. And so I think, so part of the answer is sort of stay tuned to public opinion about Minnesota in 2020. You know, when Trump was up in the 8th district campa campaigning for Stauber, he said, you know, I should have showed up to Minnesota more often in 2016, I might have won it. And I don't know that he was wrong. Um, but, you know, the Democrats didn't act like it was a particularly competitive race, and nor did the national parties. And so if both parties are sort of bringing in money, the candidates are coming in, you know, that probably all else equal helps Democrats. But it also, again, totally depends on who's on the top of the ticket, what the state of the economy, what the climate is. So the state of the economy will be really critical to the 2020 presidential election because Trump will either be credited or blamed and that will dramatically affect the election. Okay, right here in the middle. You already had one question about electoral college and I think you said it would be constitutional to, for the presidential election. But I understand, perhaps wrongly, that the number of representatives could be changed to 500. I mean, now the average representative represents 700,000 plus. It could be changed to 500, I believe, without a congressional. And then the, similarly, uh, on the census question, I understand that it would be possible, maybe it's not your expertise, to change the definition of apportionment to either be citizens versus non-citizens, now everyone's counted now, or registered voters, or people who are eligible to vote. Just wondering if you had any thought about that. So on the census questions, one of the things that the Trump administration has said they would like to do is to include sort of, you know, is, is to be much clearer about citizenship on the census and then reapportion that way. And that would have dramatic effects for Democrats, particularly in places like California, where there are some congressional districts that have, you know, a couple hundred thousand, a hundred thousand um, members who are in the process of becoming a citizen or here legally or even here illegally who are counted um, in some of the California districts in particular, but you know this is repeated in other districts as well, and they are counted um, as for purposes of apportionment in congressional districts. So that would be a pretty dramatic change which would uh, have a lot of implications both for the composition of the U.S. House and for the Electoral College. So. Cong by a, it was an act of Congress that limited the House of Representatives in uh, the 1920s to 435 members. And so Congress could do that again, but given sort of how unwieldy it is to pass laws in a chamber of 435, I just don't really see them doing that. Um, they could do it, but I don't see them doing that. Uh, for sort of practical purposes, space purposes, and then at a certain point, where do you end? Um, but they could do it. Right, Catherine, I have one over here for you. What are your thoughts on the possibility, if there is one, of congressional term limits being enacted? Congressional term limits. Um, so I am not a fan of term limits. Um, and that is largely based on political science research. And that's not to say that there are some members, you know, there are some members who clearly serve too long. There's no doubt. <laughs> I am not about to dispute that. However, policy making is complicated and it actually takes members of Congress sort of several different cycles to really become experts on the issues that they work on in their committees and the appropriations process and sort of all of the things that they really need to be good at to do a good job. And so term limits would just sort of nip all that in the bud and then other people, other entities would have more control. So political science research on the state legislatures that have enacted term limits have had some pretty depressing findings. Um, one of the findings is that the governors have much more control and much more influence, and then their bills are literally shorter, they do less, they have less expertise, and they're more influenced by lobbyists. 
One of the other claims about term limits was that they would lead to a more, div more diversity in legislatures, and that has also not happened in the state legislatures that have enacted them. So the results from term limits in state legislatures have sort of only added to my sense that term limits are not a good idea. And in fact, I can't believe that Nancy Pelosi is buying into the whole term limits for committee chairs. So that's not for, that's not term limits for members of Congress, but Republicans since 1995 have term limited their committee chairs for six years, which has led to a lot of really great members of Congress retiring, a lot less expertise on committees, and Democrats have always been very clear that this is a terrible idea, and now Pelosi is considering it. Okay, hey, one way in the back here, Vivian. My question is about judges, uh, two, kind of a two-part. Was there any way to quantify what effect the Kavanaugh hearings had on driving Republican voters to the polls? Was the immigration big enough to a big enough factor that they were coming out anyway, or did the Kavanaugh hearings turn that? And then secondly, um, what what kind of damage? I Maybe mean, that's the wrong word, but. I, I feel that it's damage. What kind of damage is McConnell doing on the lower court level? How many judgeships did they keep open during the Obama years to now fill? So the answer to your second question is a lot. I don't have precise numbers, but there were a lot of, like hundreds of vacancies when Trump took office. And so, you know, many of them have been filled, but they will continue to be filled for the next couple of years. Because of course, now there is no filibuster for uh, any judicial nominees. So sort of two different competing thoughts on the impact of the Kavanaugh, Blasey Ford hearings on enthusiasm among uh, partisans on both sides. So Democrats were already enthusiastic about the election. They were already responding to polls saying this election is very important. Republicans in the summer were much less likely, I think by around 15, 20 points, less likely than Republicans to say that the November elections were really important. And that number increased dramatically after the Kavanaugh hearings. Democrats still had an edge, but the gap had narrowed considerably. And so one thought was, you know, the Kavanaugh hearings had a really big impact on Republicans, reminding them how important the Supreme Court is, sort of engendering resentment against Democrats. But the sort of other line of thought was, well, closer to an election, partisans always begin to think that an election is important. And so it was probably a combination of those two things. I think the Kavanaugh hearings, you know, did anger a lot of Republicans and did cause many Republicans to think that the elections are more important, but some of those may have gotten there by election day through the course of the campaign anyway, but probably not all of them. Okay, right in the middle here. You've talked a little bit about um, gerrymandering tonight in particular to uh, Wisconsin. Uh, after the election of 2016, I was reading about voter suppression in Wisconsin and how Trump had perhaps won by a, a small margin given the kind of voter suppression that was going on. Could you tell us a little bit uh, what's going on with voter suppression around the, the states that touch Minnesota and how that, as well as the gerrymandering, seems to be impacting uh, voter turnout, or voter, result, voter election results. So there, you know, there's no doubt that after the 2010 elections, Republican-controlled states with a Republican governor and Republican legislatures began to pass a series of electoral reforms, voter ID, and then Democratic states were passing reforms in the opposite direction. So what we have really is sort of two different types of states these days. You know, states that have made it easier to vote, like Minnesota, highest voter turnout in the nation, and states you know, that have gone in the opposite direction. And Wisconsin is actually sort of a hybrid because it also has same-day voter registration, but it's done a number of things to sort of limit access to voting. And so, so you know, it's, it, the more barriers there are to voting, the harder it is for people to vote, and the people who are more likely to be impacted are voters with less income, younger voters, and voter, voters who are more residentially mobile, and voters of color. And so that's the consequence of some of these laws, um, and sort of that's been shown systematically. But then there are also sort of specific suppression efforts like you know, closing polling places and doing other things like that. Um, and so it's sort of hard to quantify these things in the same way. But in close elections, there's no doubt that, that these things matter. <laughs> 
Okay, I have one for you over here. My question has to do with the U.S. Senate, and you stated earlier in 2018 that the Republicans had a structural advantage. What does it look like looking to 2020? 2020 is a little more mixed. So 2020 is a, a little bit more of an even playing field. So there will definitely be some vulnerable Republicans up in 2020, but then there will also be some vulnerable Democrats up in 2020. And I think what we're really seeing is, you know, these, it is less and less likely for two senators to be of different parties representing the same states, and we're seeing more and more senators sort of aligned with their presidents, uh, with the way the state goes in presidential elections. And so that's where the action will be in 2020, is sort of some of these you know, vulnerable Democrats and Republicans, but they're more evenly divided. I mean, there are more Republicans up, but there's some vulnerable Democrats too. Okay, on the left over here in the front. I'm interested in the types of programs for voter suppression and manipulation of Supreme Court justice uh, that go on on a regular basis today and whether or not you regard the two parties as essentially equivalent in their willingness to go beyond the pale in order uh, to achieve their political ends. Do you see it as Paul Krugman, I think, sees it as being asymmetrical, or do you see it as basically a symmetrical process? And that's not to say that one party or the other can't do uh, aggressive, uh, militant uh, strike against the other, that it can't happen at all. but. On the whole, do you see it as asymmetric or symmetrical? Or aren't you willing to get into this debate? So today, I see it as asymmetrical. Sort of in 2018, it is asymmetrical. Um, Republicans in the House and Senate for the last two years have really abdicated their constitutional responsibility in the separation of power system of executive branch oversight. I mean, they really have. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, historically, I think it's a little bit, I, I think historically it's a different story. You know, you can point to examples on both sides of the aisle. And thinking about North Carolina's ninth district, you know, and Democrats until sort of something happens here will likely not seat the Republican in the ninth district. Well, in the mid 1980s, Democrats seated Herb, uh, um, McCloskey from Indiana, even though the Republican actually had more votes. They sort of, it's sort of a longer story than that. But so sort of, you know, Democrats use their part as an advantage for electoral advantage in an Indiana congressional seat. It was a little bit sort of, un, it was a little bit murky in terms of who actually should have been seated. And so, you know, there are, so neither party, you know, sort of come, is consistently above partisan gain. If you look at gerrymandering, both parties have done this historically. Democrats have done some pretty egregious gerrymanders um, over the years. In fact, there have been Supreme Court cases where Democrats from one state have aligned themselves with Republicans from another, sort of depending on which party and which state have been shut out. But today, in 2018, sort of given what's happening with voter suppression and sort of in some, of, in some states, certainly not all, in some states, and what's happening with the administration and Congress's sort of unwillingness to thoroughly investigate the White House and do its oversight of the executive branch, it is not asymmetrical. Okay, we're gonna take one more question, but before we do that, uh, let me remind you, we have uh, actually no headliners in January. You can enjoy cold weather instead of coming to headliners. Uh, but our next headliners will be on February 7th. Uh, you've all heard about artificial intelligence. That's what we're gonna talk about. It's uh, title, Intelligent Machines, AI's Present and Future be presented by a Morse alumni distinguished teaching professor of computer science, Dr. Maria Gini. So we, we look forward to seeing all of you then. So Anastasia, you have someone with the last question over there. Uh, polling clearly failed in 2016. Uh, what went wrong? Why does it matter? What's being done to change it? Polling did fail in 2016. With the caveat that part of the problem was, so the polls were off, 
The polls were off nationally, and the polls were off in key swing states. But they weren't actually off by much. Part of our problem was that we kept looking at the predictions instead of the polls. And the predictions predicting a 75% chance for a Clinton win make us think that Clinton is going to win. I mean, understandably, 80%. One even had 99%. But you know, she was always only ahead by a couple percentage points. She actually won the popular vote by a few percentage points. And so if you look at the poll results consistently, they got the Clinton support right, consistently. What they did was underestimate support for Trump for a couple of reasons. One, they didn't sort of have the right sample of voters. They didn't find enough tr Trump supporters, and they didn't have enough rural men without college degrees who were more likely to support Trump than the same demographic had been in any other presidential election cycle. So Trump voters were harder to find, and when pollsters did their weighting, weighting W-E-I-G-H-T-E-D, um, in other words, to make the sample representative, they undercounted, uh, in particular, white men without college degrees, who were a pretty huge part of Trump's base, what, whereas pollsters didn't realize this, um, in part because they undercounted them, in part because of differences from the last election. But they missed, they missed support for Trump, they got support for Clinton right. So pollsters had a big sort of meeting about this. The American uh, Association of Public Opinion Researchers put out a report, and so they really tried to do a better job in 2018, and by and large, I think they did. Um, there were fewer polls in some of these house races, um, but the prediction models, um, which now one of my colleagues, or colleagues refers to as recreational science as opposed to <laughs> actual, like, you know, so you don't take them to the bank. Um, you know, they, they were more accurate. I mean, they predicted sort of anywhere from, you know, 30 to 45 seat pickups for Democrats. All right, well, thank you very much, and uh, an applause for Dr. Pearson. So, so um, you, you, you can all make your reservations for two years from now when we'll do this again, all right? So thanks for coming. Have a wonderful holiday season, and we'll see you in February.